Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument is slightly larger than Glacier National Park at 1,048,000 acres. That is so big. Yeah, and this is so big. This isn't even Grand Canyon National Park. This is yeah. just one of the wilderness areas like around it. Like a chunk of it. <laughs> which is the size of another very popular park, yes. Glacier. That's huge. It's yeah. a very remote, undeveloped area, uh, jointly managed by the National Park Service and BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, lo- located in the northern edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, there are no paved roads in this area, so this is very backcountry. Yeah. You're not going here unless you either know the area or are looking for adventure, really. It's incredibly rugged. So I've I've seen the Grand Canyon, but I've never hiked it. And the Grand Canyon among hikers is generally known as a harder place to hike. Mm-hmm. So up that a notch with this wilderness area. Yeah, not even being in a heavily regulated portion of the park. Yeah, you've got none of the services that you'd expect in the national park. It's It's very wild and untamed which a lot of people love Mm -hmm. so absolutely i mean that's that's what we kind of prefer to get away from the people and become one with the land yeah so backcountry permits are still required though unlike some blm land well no i so my for overnight this is for grand canyon national park oh okay yeah i thought this was for the other part so up in this area as i say blm typically you can kind of just pretty much because it's it's so vast and big and there's not really tons of traffic so you're not really damaging stuff yep so for Grand Canyon, you do need that stuff. There's lots of other activities. This is the north area where there's not much going on. Yeah. Uh, this part is located in Arizona. Uh, it was established in January 11th of 2000. So relatively new, 21 years old. Yep. Uh, it only sees about 80, 88,000 visitors per year, which is low compared to what you see at other major areas of the park. I'm sure yeah. Grand Canyon Park is in the millions. Oh, yeah. Because it's so popular. Yep. Uh, since it is located in the northern edge of the Grand Canyon, uh, the following facts that we're going to go over are statistics that relate to Grand Canyon National Park. So it is north of there. Uh, so we're not talking specifically about this area because it simply isn't monitored that closely. Yeah. And I, when I, you know, doing the research, I tried to differentiate between when we were talking about the actual monument area versus the national park. So, okay. Um, so this is, this is cool. Uh, it, this is in the monument. A yeah. 2005 expedition to examine 24 caves in the park had produced two new species of millipede, the first bark loose discovered in North America, and a whole new genus of cricket and four new cricket species, which is like really exciting for yeah. people who are into insects. Yes. <laughs> I hate bugs, so I'm not going to say I don't care, but I just don't like bugs. So, yeah. Not so that's a, not, not up my alley. I'm not a big fan either. <clears throat> Uh, A rim-to-rim hike of the Grand Canyon is one of the longest hikes there. It's 44 miles round trip, which usually takes approximately five to seven days to complete. It's about the distance I did in Kilimanjaro. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool hikes I would love to do. I've always wanted to do a horseback trip in Grand Canyon. You know what I want to do there? Um, Or you go down, and this is like total glamping style hike yeah. <laughs> you do the rafting stuff oh yeah and you raft along camp and then you keep rafting and camp right on the shore so you can like swim and we stuff we talked like that. about doing that almost every year and we never do yeah we should probably just we should just we do should, it we should, we're getting older now you know yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> this backcountry stuff's getting you know, it's, it's getting harder to do yeah <laughs> life gets in the way so according to the Copen climate classification system second episode we've mentioned them yes yep <laughs> Copen with an umlaut because i know what that is <laughs> The Grand Canyon National Park is five climate zones, cold, semi-arid, humid, continental, dry, cool summer, humid, continental, dry, warm summer, (laughs) warm summer, Mediterranean, and hot summer, Mediterranean. That's hot hiker summer. They should make a song for that. Hot hiker summer. (laughs) I love it. On average, the hottest months are June through August with average highs around 82 to 85, which is actually not too bad. I would have thought it would have been a lot hotter. Mm Mm-hmm. The coldest months are typically November through April with average lows ranging from 29 degrees to 18. Record highs coming at 101 in June and negative 20 in December and February. Huge range of temperatures in this yeah. park. And even, Joel will get into a uh, little bit more of the weather, but even in the hottest months of the summer, it can still get cold. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's a desert setting. And that's yeah. what it says. So when it gets, it can get very cold at night because it's desert, uh, even in June and July. Uh, lows routinely dip between the 40s and 50s. So that's where you can get into potential, uh, well, I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Hypothermia. Hypothermia. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, on average, Grand Canyon National Park gets about 15.3 inches of rain with June as the driest month and July and August as the wettest months. 
To put this in perspective, LA gets about 15 inches of rain per year, while New York City gets almost 46 inches of rain per year. So, so it's dry. It's very dry. Yeah. Uh, GCNP also <laughs> gets the about. Canyon yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we. Well, you decided to sh- shorten I did. this part. Uh, they get about 43 inches of snow per year. That I didn't know. Yeah. I did not know it snowed there. I it would does. have never guessed that. Just I've only flown over it when I'm going to Arizona or mm-hmm. California, and it just seems like the rest of the desert. I've only seen it in the summer, so no snow. But yeah, yeah. it it gets a de- you know some decent snowfall. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. So uh, the national park encompasses 277 miles of the Colorado River and the adjacent uplands. In spots, the Grand Canyon is up to a mile deep and over 18 miles wide. That's crazy. It's big. That's that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, I get, we got to go. I know. And we got to stop saying we got to go and just actually go. It's like one of the it's one of the natural wonders of the world. Yeah. And we haven't hiked it yet. Well, it's a mile deep. Yeah. It's like That's really, like a mile. That's like <laughs> really, it's like really deep. <laughs> but even like 18 miles across. That's yeah. insane, too. So layered bands of colorful rock, some dating back to the Precambrian times, which is 541 million to 4.6 billion years ago, can be seen throughout the Grand Canyon. So that's what's cool about the depth is like you can literally see the different levels. Like you'd normally have to dig that out, but the water did it for us. And for those of you who know your geology and science, 4.6 billion is roughly the age of the planet. So you can see some of the oldest rocks on the planet yeah, it formed park. when the whole planet was a volcanic yeah, you know, wasteland, basically. Hellhold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the canyon itself was created by an incision of the Colorado River and the tributaries after the Colorado Plateau was uplifted, causing the Colorado River system to develop along its present path. So that little river at the bottom carved that thing over hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of it years. It really is amazing when you go and see the Grand Canyon and how vast and huge it is. And then the tiny little river is in the bottom and like yeah. how long it took to cut through that rock. Yes. <laughs> well, and you think about like where all that sediment eventually went. Yeah. Like all over, went into the ocean, then over those billions of years moved around or all that stuff. So yeah. it's, it's really cool. Uh, in the monument, elevations range from the lows of 1,200 feet above sea level uh, at Grand Walsh Bay at Lake Mead to the peak of 8,000 feet at Mount Turnbull. So nothing too crazy as far as altitude goes. Yep. Uh, just more like the aridness of the area, I think, yeah. is probably what's the worst. Exposure and aridness. Yeah. Uh, in Grand Canyon National Park, elevations range from 1,200 feet at the Colorado River to 9,100 feet to the North Rim entrance. So the types of dangers that are present here. There's over 90 species of mammals 450 species of birds, eight species of amphibian, 41 species of reptiles, and some of those animals include bighorn sheep, bison, elk, mule deer, uh, mountain lions. Those obviously are ones that can pose a risk to people hiking alone. Uh, California condor, uh, gila monster. What's a gila monster? It looks like a big fat like lizard. Have you ever seen them? <clears throat> They're like I haven't because that's why I asked you what it was. <laughs> I guess that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean they uh, they have real stubby legs. They're real like th- like thick, and they have like a their tongue looks like a snake's tongue. It comes out all the time like a snake. Oh, what are those big ones that are in like Japan? Komodo dragons. Yeah, is it, it's like a small version of that. Kind of. Yeah, they kind yeah. of are similar. That would have been easier to describe. You said it kind of looks like a baby komodo dragon. Yeah, I guess a I fat baby komodo <laughs> dragon instead of uh, the all the stuff you just did. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> we we have rattlesnakes. Those obviously can be an issue. Uh, it's also a variety to a bunch of scorpions, uh, which some are venomous and so, tarantulas. Yeah, so there's there's some stuff that can get you. And what's crazy, I've always known because I've been stung by a scorpion before, and it's not fun. It's like yeah. a really bad bee sting. But the bigger the scorpion, the better. Really? Yes. The smaller they are the more venomous they are. Huh. Uh, that That's one thing I learned when uh, I got bit, freaked out, and called poison control. And they're like, <laughs> your tongue turns purple, call 911. I was right. like, yeah, I definitely won't wait if, yeah. if that happens. Um, so yeah, they're, uh, those are all very common. You know, if you're alone, again, you can have health problems if you get stung, bitten, whatever. Um, you got to watch out for that. Right, rattlesnake bite is going to be more of a concern, but even a yeah, snake clotting bite, the blood. Yeah, mm-hmm. even sometimes when you get bit by a snake, it doesn't inject the venom, so... But you yeah, should just... You still don't want to. It's easy to <laughs> avoid a snake bite for the most part by just... If you see a snake, don't 
you know, mess around with it and just kind of keep an eye on like where you're walking. It's easy to avoid snake bite by not going near snakes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the exposures, uh, heat in the warm months, uh, just like every other park, if you're not bringing water, especially with the dryness, yeah. uh, you're going to lose water faster. You're going to sweat, but in the areas that are dry, it almost like sucks it out of you. And I'm mm-hmm. sure you know that from Canyon lands, like you lose water way faster in a dry climate versus a humid one. Yep. Um, so you have that uh, direct exposure to sunlight. So if you're not wearing appropriate clothing, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and just as we say, you never want to wait till you're thirsty when you're filling up. You always want to stay hydrated. Yeah. And an interesting <clears throat> thing too is I read the human body can really only absorb about a liter of water an hour. So if you're already dehydrated, your dehydration could maybe run away from the ability of your body to absorb water. So it's always important to just kind of keep sipping water throughout your hike. Well, and preload. Drink tons of water before you even go. Yeah, and the Park Service recommends uh, at least carrying four liters of water per day if you're hiking in the summer months in Grand Canyon. Yeah. Uh, There's obviously cold at night, so if you don't have the proper gear for overnight, you can uh, go into hypothermia, now that Mike reminded me of the word. Yeah. Uh, Lightning can be an issue, too. With no trees or or very exposed terrain, uh, you are the tallest spot a lot of times. So yep. if you're in a caught in a lightning storm, that can be very dangerous. Uh, the possibility of flash floods, even though there is very little rain, the soil there is not made to absorb it. So if a lot of rain starts hitting, even somewhere where you're not, you can be swept away in the flash floods. Those can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. So difficulty in general, uh, majority of the Grand Canyon hikers are here for the first time and some may be avid hikers, but aren't used to the type of climate uh, that they're in is kind of like a desert climate. If you're mm-hmm. not used to that, if you normally go to more, you know, greenery, natural parks, things like that, it's it's a completely different thing. Yeah. So just being prepared, uh, food, water, understanding what you're doing, you know, giving your itineraries the way you're going to survive in this type of park. Yeah. Um. Outside of that, what do you what do you think biggest risks are? Exposure. Uh. Absolutely. I think dehydration is the number one risk. I think people don't people know they need water for when they're hiking, but I don't think people think they don't think about how much water they're going to sweat out, especially if they're exerting themselves, you know, all day with a heavy pack on. Um, and if you've exposed skin, sun on the skin makes it like, I think people think sometimes like, Oh, if I wear pants and long sleeve shirt, I'm going to sweat more. Yeah. And the reality is the sun's going to be drying you out. So it's not that you're sweating less. It's you're not feeling it. Yeah, it's and me the drying. sweat cools your body off. Yeah, it's me drying you out. And then even if you are, you know, hydrated, you're going to be just destroyed by sunburn. So, you know, even if you're safe, like you're going to be uncomfortable. Uh, there's nothing more uncomfortable than hiking in 100 degree heat with sunburn. So, you know, always when you're hiking in, you know, desert climates like Grand Canyon, you know, wear long sleeved clothing. Yeah. Um, and you don't hike during the heat of the day. Personally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even hike Grand Canyon during the summer. I would. Yeah. I would probably not go any earlier Spring than and fall. September. Yeah. yeah, non-rain months. It may be like May. Um, you well, know, even just desert conditions. Look at any culture that is a desert culture. Yeah. How are they dressed? They dre- They look like they're uncomfortable because they're covered in like. Cl- they're just covered. Their skin's covered. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They live in it. I mean, I always, I always <laughs> joke, mimic like, them. Yeah, look at cowboy movies. They're not riding around in yeah, t-shirts anybody and in the middle east like <laughs> anybody in the middle east that live in desert all the time yeah. they're covered because you do not want exposed skin so. absolutely so yeah i think i think dehydration is um your top concern i think uh because it's so vast i think real interesting story joe didn't touch on it here but uh i won't get into it uh too in depth, but there's a lot of hazards in Grand Canyon and it's so vast. A lot of people think they can just go stomping around off trail doing what they want. Well, there's a story about this guy. Um, I think this happened back in 2009. He was a 20 year old student, a very fit guy, hiked a lot and he went kind of off trail and he went kind of, uh, you know, he was kind of hopping down cliffs to get down to the Colorado and he had, he had no like actual path that he was going. He was just kind of you know, oh, there's a cliff I can jump down on. along wherever he wanted to. And he he jumped down onto a cliff ledge, and he got down there, and then he realized, oh, crap, uh, I can't go any further down. It's too far of a, a drop. And then he realized he can't get back up from where he jumped down because he didn't have any climbing gear on him, and he ended up dying of dehydration on that cliff, and it was something like he was only less than a mile away from 
the river. So oh. like he could almost see water, but he couldn't get off that cliff ledge because, you know, that, I mean, there's a reason yeah. why they put trails in the park to keep, it's to keep you safe. Yeah. And there's a lot of wildlife they don't want you trampling on. And that's why I never go hiking alone. <laughs> yeah. And you don't, you don't go hiking alone. And, um, you know, if I was hiking in somewhere like this monument, I would definitely have a you know personal locator beacon or a satellite phone with me in yeah. case something went wrong. Well, to me, that's not hiking alone. If you have something that can contact yeah. externally, like that's hiking with backup. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get into Floyd Roberts. So Floyd went missing on the 17th of June. Is that June? June. Yeah. June 17th, which was a Friday. I uh, was reported missing on the next day, Saturday. Uh, Floyd was a male age 52. Uh, he was 5'11", 170 pounds. So average size guy. Yep. Um, based on the weight, pretty fit. Yeah. You know, not overweight. Uh, hair was graying brown hair, brown eyes. Uh, the clothes he was last seen in was a red long sleeve shirt, blue jeans, multicolored mesh Nike free uh, Nike free sneakers, sunglasses with white frames and orange lenses, and a large blue low alpine contour backpack. He brought two gallons of water with him and enough food to last a week. So Roberts has uh, his two inch scar above his upper rear hamstring and a small mole next to his right nostril. So we know exactly what he looks like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he lived in Huntsville, Alabama and worked for NASA. Uh, eventually moved to Treasure Island, Florida, where he taught computer programming and game design at Middleton High School. So I already like him because he's a smart guy. At, yeah. He worked at NASA and is a computer programmer. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Floyd had been hiking with his best friend, Ned Bryant, in the area around Grand Canyon on almost a yearly basis since 1992. So he was very familiar with the area. He seemed to be geared appropriately. Yep. Seemed like he knew what he was doing. Yeah. So Ned Bryant and his wife were board members of the Grand Canyon Hikers and Backpackers Association. I bet you can't be a board member if you don't know anything about the area. Yeah, I think it's safe to say his friend, Ned Bryant, is probably a very experienced uh, backpacker and hiker yeah. as well. While Roberts hasn't been hiking for a few years, friends and family said he was a very experienced backcountry hiker and had hiked this area, uh, this very area in 2011 without incident. So yeah, not only is he an experienced hiker, but he's actually literally hiked the same route just a few years before he went missing. So he knew the area. I mean, how many hikes have we done twice? Probably. Oh yeah. Very, I, even very I, we, I did the exact same thing, the exact same route in Glacier. And That's probably the only place you've hiked twice. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it's unusual for most people to, unless they live by that park. Yeah, to hike if it. we live close to a place, I'm sure we do it multiple times. But even then, you try and do something new. Yeah. So, you're not doing the same thing. So, I mean, it, it, very rarely in our cases that we cover, the people are this familiar with the area. So, it uh, just makes the disappearance more unusual. Yep. All right. So, why don't you get us into the timeline? Yeah, so the timeline is a little shorter uh, compared to some of the cases we do. But like Joe said, it starts off on June 17th of 2016. It's a Friday. So Floyd Roberts, his best friend, Ned Bryant, and Bryant's daughter, Madeline, uh, Madeline, uh, sorry, who I believe was 12, uh, plan to set out on a nine-day hike of the monument area. So they plan to hike on the, I believe it's called the Shivwitz Plateau, and eventually exit the canyon via Separation Canyon. And this is according... Here, I can help you, Mike. <laughs> okay. Madeline. Madeline. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go on. Sorry. Um, this was according to the uh, MPS report. And so now this plateau is an extensive plateau that pretty much covers the entire area of the case we're talking about today. Um, so they plan to do this hike for about nine days, uh, the group headed towards the extreme western portion of the Grand Canyon and an area that Joe mentioned earlier called Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument, and specifically near Trail Canyon um, and 214 Mile Canyon, which is around the Shanley Spring area. Um, so the uh, group planned to spend the first couple of days camped alongside the river, and they anticipated that they would emerge back into civilization around June 26th. So now this is the part of the story that where things start not making sense to me. Um, same day, 4.45 p.m., uh, just before the group was going to reach their main trailhead to start their hike, they came upon a, you know, a small hill. Uh, one of the posts by Ned Bryant said that this was not like a hill that you would um, do you take half a day to hike. It was like a real small, just like a quick over and you're done. And for whatever reason, 
I always hate when people split up. Yeah. But Ned Bryant and his daughter want, decided to go up over the hill while Roberts decided to go around the hill. And uh, like I said, Ned described it as a, just a small hill, nothing, you know, something that would take maybe 30 minutes to go over. Mm-hmm. Um, he also mentioned that going around the hill uh, took about the same time, but there was like thick brush that Roberts would have had to go through. Um, conditions during um, on the this day were, I think they said around 92 degrees Fahrenheit with temps rising to 110 So in the next few days. So it was very hot. Um, they're hiking in June. Like I said, I don't know that I would, uh, if I'm only hiking Grand Canyon once in my life, probably not going to do it in June. Yeah. We're, it's going to be miserable. I'm going to do it in, you know, where it's a little cooler out yeah, during fall. the day. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're still kind of hiking during the mid heat of the day. Like I know when we were in Canyonlands, we would take a break kind of from about 1130 to about two or three. Yep and try to find some shade because that's the hottest part of the day to hike in. And if you can conserve your energy and, you know, your water, you can make, you can cover more ground when it's cooler out and closer to dark. So again, I, I don't get some of the decisions they made. Um, so when Ned and his daughter reached the other side of the hill, there was no sign of Roberts. So uh, they immediately started looking for him. They retraced their steps uh, all the way back to the road. Uh, no sign of him. This one, and this is shocking. Uh, 30 minutes. That's it. That's the amount of time they were separated. Yeah, that's wild. I, I mean, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get through the timeline a little more. Did, I, it, did it have the name of the trailhead that they were going or the name of the trail? Um, that I missed out? I think they were hiking near Trail Canyon slash 214 Mile Canyon. Okay. They were near the Shanley Spring area. And he was last seen, I've got a picture in here, Joe. He was last seen at Kelly Tanks, which is a lake. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, so he was just, he just vanished. 30 minutes. And um, so, you know, they retraced their steps. I'm sure they, they kind of scoured that hill area. And when they found no sign of him, him and his daughter decided to camp there for the night, hoping that Roberts had just gotten lost and he'd wander his way back in the camp. They even laid their sleeping bags out in trees to try to make it easier for uh, Roberts to see where they were camping if he ended up walking walking by. So um, now it's the morning of June 18th of 2016. Um, Ned and his daughter wake up, still no sign of Roberts. Ned and his daughter then have to hike back out to try and get to cell phone service. So they, they didn't get to cell phone service until 3 p.m. that day, which uh, in my research of um, Grand Canyon and from being in Canyonlands, these areas rarely have cell reception. Now, that's not to say don't bring your phone, but you're not going to get cell phone reception in the vast majority of Grand Canyon yeah, or any of these big western parks. Um, so it's June 18th, 2016, 3 p.m., Ned uh, reports Roberts missing to the National Park Service. Uh, Ned uh, reports to the Park Service that um, he was last equipped with two uh, two gallons of water, a week's worth of food, and a map created by Ned Bryant to uh, with their planned route on it. So, this is, sorry, I had my mic off because I was clearing <laughs> my throat. But this is like one of those cases where the guy who's missing is actually in a really good spot as far as. Like, okay, if he's lost, can't find people, he's got all this stuff. Yeah. He can survive for a week normally. Yeah. And then arguably, if he can have access to water, they're close to a river, you know, another week without food if he's getting water regularly. So at, at worst case scenario, what, a week and three days? Yeah. And they said, uh, you know, family made comments that unless he Ned, unless Roberts was severely injured, he would have had the smarts to find water. Sure. And... um. So they just couldn't contemplate that. Did, did they mention, he said he, they had a map or did. So it sounds like he, uh, uh, Roberts had a handmade map that Ned made, which mm. I, 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 that, I don't, I don't know. Like he handmade it. Like, we always shot. get the national geographic, like waterproof, waterproof maps. maps. Yeah. Like that's what we always have that. That's, yeah. that's what I'd write. It's what, like 
ten dollars yeah you can get them on amazon yeah and i collect them every time i go to a new place like yeah. I, I it's cool to keep the pack whatever but, so uh, you okay. know whatever he whatever. made a map i mean maybe copy and pasted map <laughs> 